There's two ditches that you can fall into as it pertains to false religion. There's two ditches that you have to avoid. And on one side, you can become, I guess, what we would call progressive or or liberal or too innovative when it comes to the things of God, and then you just lose your focus on the Lord because you're, you're too focused on pleasing the world and starting to look like what the world looks like. And so you go down, you go in that ditch, things start to fall apart, things start to unravel, the trolley goes off the tracks. And the other ditch, I mean, if, the, if that ditch is, we call it liberalism, I guess, progressivism, the other ditch, I think we could call it conservatism. And when I say conservatism, I'm saying being traditional or conservative for the sake of it. Even trying to conserve the truth, but yet becoming so preoccupied with the conservation of the truth that you miss the one who is truth in the flesh, Christ. And so both of those tracks will take you somewhere that you do not want to go. They'll take you away from the Lord. And what you'll develop is a cold-hearted, or caustic, or callous religion. You don't want to go in either one of those directions. And in fact, both of those directions, although they look like opposites, are really going to the same place because they're going away from the Lord. And they're both innovations of the devil. One, formalism or conservatism for the sake of it. The other would be progressivism or liberalism for the sake of it. But either one of those, both of those, stem from a focus that has gotten onto something it should have never been on. It should have never been on. How do you protect against that? Well, we learn about that a bit today. You protect against it by being focused on the Lord Jesus, who is the embodiment of truth, who is the truth itself. And if you love the Lord Jesus and you want to trust the Lord Jesus and have a relationship with the Lord Jesus and stay focused on him, you won't go off the rails on either side. You won't go off the rails on either side. Matthew 16, verses 5 through 12. When the disciples reached the other side, they had forgotten to bring any bread. Jesus said to them, Watch and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. And they began discussing it amongst themselves, saying, We brought no bread. But Jesus, aware of this, said, O you of little faith, why are you discussing among yourselves the fact that you have no bread. Do you not perceive? Do you not remember the five loaves for the 5,000? And how many baskets you gathered? Or the seven loaves for the 4,000? And how many baskets you gathered? How is it that you fail to understand that I did not speak about bread? Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Then they understood that he did not tell them to beware of the leaven of bread but of the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Bow with me for a quick word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we pray for your blessing and anointing upon our time together, that the preaching would be full of power, that sinners would be saved, and that your church would be strengthened. May our eyes be focused. Give us a single eye for Christ. May we not get off track in one direction or another but may we be focused on the living and vibrant Savior who gives us life and from whom life flows. In Christ's name, amen. So a little bit of review. Every time Jesus encounters the rulers, there's controversy. Every time. The religious leaders specifically but as you get to the end of the gospel, it's not just the religious leaders, it's the governing authorities. But at this point, it's the religious leaders. Specifically, there's controversy. There's controversy. 
And if you don't have the stomach for controversy, you can't handle it, you wouldn't have the stomach to be a disciple of Christ. You have to have your eyes focused on Christ to pull through the trials that the Lord leads you through. And so in chapter 14, there's the feeding of the fourth or the 5,000. 5,000, they were Jews, plus women and children. And it was a wonderful time. The people are fed, they're happy, they leave satisfied. And then right after that, immediately after that, there's a bunch of healings. And it's, again, a wonderful time. But then you transition right into chapter 15. And after these joyful times of feedings and healing and miracles, you get into chapter 15. And what happens there is that Jesus encounters the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and there's controversy. Immediately, controversy erupts. And I find it interesting that that passage in chapter 15 where the controversy erupts is about cleanliness codes. The Pharisees were bothered by the fact that Christ's disciples did not practice the Pharisaical cleanliness codes. They didn't wash their hands before they ate. And so that's right in between two feedings, feeding of the 5,000 and feeding of the 4,000. The Pharisees pick on Jesus and his disciples for not observing the Pharisaical cleanliness codes, not washing their hands before thee. They missed the fact that Christ has showed up in the flesh and that thousands have been fed with just a few small loaves and they're nitpicky over the cleanliness code and the washing of the hands. No, I'm not, I'm not against washing hands. I do that every now and then. Okay? But I'm much more concerned about Jesus. Okay? Much more concerned about Jesus. So, but these guys could care less about Jesus, and that came out, and that ex- was exposed when they were more concerned about cleanliness, cleanliness codes. Okay? There was a Canaanite woman in ja- Gen- or Matthew 15. She was a Gentile woman. Jesus heals her right after the controversy with the Pharisee. Another wonderful time of miracles and joy. And then there's more healings in, Je- in, in Matthew 15 and other more Gentiles. Time of wonder and joy and happiness. And then there's feeding of 4,000 in Matthew 15. Joy, happiness, awe, wonder. All Gentiles by this point in time, the Canaanite woman, the various healings, the feeding of the 4,000. And then you get to Matthew 16, and again, you got controversy. Where does the controversy erupt? It doesn't erupt when Jesus is just mingling with the crowds. The controversy erupts when he comes in contact with the rulers, specifically the religious rulers. There's constant friction. And today, where we find ourselves is Jesus addressing the controversy that has just erupted with the religious rulers. With the religious rulers. So there's always, it seems, every time the Lord is with the religious rulers, every time he's with the rulers, he's challenging their sensibilities, he's grating at them, they do not like him, and he's getting under their skin. Well, here he's with his disciples, and we find in verse 5 of chapter 16, when the disciples reach the other side, so they're in a boat, they get to the other side of the sea, And what do we find? But the disciples are hungry. So there's really five movements in this text that I'm looking at. And the first one is the disciples are hungry. Verse 5. When the disciples reached the other side of the sea, they see they had forgotten to bring any bread. They didn't have bread. Now, who were the disciples? They were 12 young men. Right? They weren't old men. They were young men. We know that. And they were young men and they were rough, hardworking men. There was a lot of personality in the disciples. Right, you got Simon the Zealot, you've got fishermen, you've got tax collectors. There's, there's, there's a lot of personality within these guys. So 12 hard-working, vigorous young men full of vitality and personality are hungry. Have you ever seen a football team or a hockey team that's hungry after the game. We need food, right? Like, I don't know if you ever sat down in a restaurant and a hockey team walks in and a bunch of kids walk in and they're all ready to eat. I mean, there's a mood in the room when that happens. K 
Kids are hungry, young men are hungry, and they've gathered together, and they gather around Jesus, and there's no food. So you know what the talk is amongst the 12, right? They got a crowd. They've been working hard with Jesus, doing ministry. They get to the other side, and what does it happen? It happens they forgot their bread. A lot of personality with these guys. They're hardworking guys, and they're young, and they need some food after some travel. So they're hungry. Well, Jesus warns them about leaven. This is the next movement. We're in the next section. He warns them about leaven. Verse 6, Jesus said to them, Watch and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So these guys are looking for bread to eat. And Jesus takes the opportunity to warn them about leaven. Well, what's leaven? Leaven is what you put in dough to make it rise. It's a live culture, and you put it into the dough, and you mix it in, and after you mix it in, the culture, gases come out of the culture, and it creates the little holes that you see in your loaf of bread. It's leaven. It lightens, it leavens the loaf, and the bread rises because the, the culture, the live culture within the bread, produced the gas, and that's what makes the bread rise, and what they would have to do in those days is what many do now. If you want to leaven your loaf, you have to take a piece of another loaf. So you got one dough with no leaven, and then you got another little piece of a previous loaf with a little bit of leaven in it, and you mix it in. And you let it sit there, and the culture takes over the loaf, and slowly the loaf rises, and the leaven takes over the loaf. So the, Jesus is, the, the guys are talking about bread. Jesus, we need some bread to eat. We're very hungry. We've been busy with you. And Jesus says to them, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Or watch and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And it's a very strong commandment if you see it in verse 6. Watch and beware. So there's two imperatives. And the tense of the verbs are such that it's a constant action. To beware and to be vigilant in the paying attention of this. And so you can see where their minds are going. Where are their minds going? Well, here we are. We're meeting with Jesus. We're really hungry. We need some bread, Jesus. And Jesus says, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And the mind goes, oh, I can't buy bread off the Pharisees. That's where the mind is. Because their mind is on their stomach. They feel the hunger pains. And Jesus says, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And they're like, okay, I guess we can't get bread from the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Discipleship, here's the thing. Discipleship is always active. There's always threats to your walk with the Lord Jesus, and you can never let your guard down. And so the disciples are hearing this come from Jesus, and they're like, okay, I guess this is part of discipleship. We can't buy bread. We can't buy leavened loaves. We can't buy this stuff from the Pharisees and the Sadducees, so I guess we have to be careful because Jesus is now giving us food laws. That's where their mind goes. In fact, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, specifically the Pharisees, had their own type of leaven that they were allowed to eat. So they actually had lists in their codes, in their cleanliness codes, about, okay, you can't eat this type of leaven, but you can eat this type of leaven. And one thing is, leaven, any of you that's done any baking, there's, there's different cultures of it. So you cultivate different cultures. And there were certain ones that the Pharisees were allowed to have. There were certain ones that they were not allowed to have. So they had articles. Okay, what do we do with Gentile leaven? What do we do with Egyptian leaven? I don't know if we can handle that stuff, but we have to stay with some other stuff. And so the, Jesus is teaching the disciples. And they're like, oh, okay, I guess Jesus is talking about Pharisaical food laws. And we're not allowed to practice the food laws that they have. He's got different food laws for us. And Jesus just lumps the two together, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, as if he's saying one and the other. They're both the same. And so you can see that the disciples are a little confused here. They're confused. We're moving on to the next section. What is, okay, like we're trying to figure this out. The Pharisees and the Sadducees, we can't have their leaven loaves. We're very hungry. We don't really get what he's talking about. And Jesus hints at something. Just in this little mysterious instruction that he provides. And this is what he hints at. He says, the Pharisees and Sadducees, not the Pharisees and the Sadducees. There's only one article. So pay attention to that. He's giving something away. There's not two articles. 
It's not the Pharisees and the Sadducees. It's the Pharisees and Sadducees. There's only one article. And the reason there's only one article is that it's the same leaven. But they're not the same people. But it's the same leaven. The Pharisees and the Sadducees are completely different people. They're polar opposites on the religious spectrum. In fact, before the time of Christ, they would have clashed a lot. The Pharisees, on one hand, were a group of people who were attempting to conserve the Jewish traditions and conserve the law. So they would have been considered the more conservative people. They didn't really want to get involved with the Roman government. They just wanted to keep to themselves and conserve the religion. And then the Sadducees were more politically savvy. They were connected with the government. You would have called them progressive, whereas the Pharisees believed in a future resurrection of the dead. The Sadducees would have been more rationalistic and would have said, no, there is no future resurrection of the dead. And so they're, they're, they're warring factions within Judaism, one being more conservative, one being more liberal. But yet Jesus refers to them as the same. The Sadducees and Pharisees, or rather the Pharisees and Sadducees, they're the same. But the disciples are, are confused over this. So they, they're trying to figure all this out. Verse 7, Jesus is kind of throwing them off with this remark. And keep, keep in mind, like, how... How mentally with it are you when you're hungry? Right? Your head's aching. You're, you're feeling it in your stomach. I just, I just, my blood sugar is, is down. I just need to get some food in me, right? The hanger just takes over. It's amazing how much the Bible talks about food. And so in verse 7, they begin discussing it amongst themselves. What's going on? Saying, we brought no bread. So why is he telling us not to eat this type of bread? We don't even have any bread. Never mind Pharisee bread and Sadducee bread. There is no bread. There is no bread. So they're talking about bread and what Christ has just said. And in verse 7, they're discussing this amongst themselves. And their mind is going to this place where, okay, he doesn't want us to eat Pharisee food. So what food are we going to eat? Because we've got no food. We don't, it's not like you have a lot of options here. We have no options. We're hungry and Jesus wants to talk about Pharisee bread. It's very interesting. I think it's important to note and just pause here. And make an observation, and that is this. The concept of a leavened loaf is very significant in the Bible. Because when the Jews left Egypt, the Israelites left Egypt, they had to leave the Egyptian leaven behind. They were not to take any Egyptian cultures of leaven with them into the wilderness and into the promised land. In order to be saved from the wrath of God in Egypt... One of the things they had to leave behind was Egyptian leaven. And you see that specifically in Exodus 12 or Leviticus 2 or Leviticus 6 that comes out. And during the Passover festivities, the Jews had to clean the leaven out of their house. And so when Jesus is speaking in spiritual terms here, which the the disciples don't quite yet understand, what he's telling them is He's not here to reform the Pharisaical religion. He's not here to reform the religion of the Sadducees. He's here to call these people out of it. It's time to start something new. It's time for an exodus from this corrupt, God-forsaken, really, religion that wants nothing to do with the Lord Jesus Christ, and you need to remove yourself from it completely, because if you don't remove yourself from it completely, it's going to get right into your system of thinking, and it's going to take you down a bad path. And the Pharisees and the Sadducees have one thing in common. They may be polar opposites on the religious and political spectrum, but they have one thing in common, and what they have in common is cold hearts towards Jesus. And so that needs to be left behind. They're hungry, talking about the need for bread. Jesus warns them about a particular type of leaven. They think he's talking about bread made by the Pharisees and Sadducees. And they don't quite get it. And so they're a little bit confused. But there's a spiritual reality going on in the background. Because they're so focused on their hunger pains that they're not realizing that the Lord is trying to teach them something spiritual. So Jesus corrects them. He corrects them. Verse 8. But Jesus, aware of this, so he's aware that they're discussing this amongst themselves, said, oh, you of little faith, why are you discussing among yourselves the fact that 
you have no bread. They're preoccupied with earthly things. When our minds become preoccupied with earthly things, we miss what's most important. We miss what's most important. And Christ is teaching his disciples not to be preoccupied with earthly things, but to be preoccupied with heavenly things. What is the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees? Well, we already know about the Pharisees. What do they live for? Impressing men. The Pharisees loved the attention of men. They loved that the masses saw them praying. They loved that the masses saw them giving. The Sadducees loved hobnobbing with the political effete. Both groups lived for earthly things. And if the disciples at this particular point in time are hungering for bread more than they're hungering for the righteousness of Jesus Christ, they're moving towards an earthly religion. And when we get preoccupied, if you get preoccupied with earthly things at the expense of heavenly things, if that's where your mind tends to go, and so the Pharisees love the approval of the crowds, the Sadducees love the approval of the political effete, they both kind of go in their direction, and if this is where your mind tends to go, then you're moving towards a religion that satisfies not heavenly appetites, a hungering, thirsting for the righteousness of God, but a hungering and thirsting for the things of this world. And Jesus is catching them in the act of moving in that direction. Guys, don't be so concerned about your food. You've already taught you that I provide food when I want to. So he corrects them. And I've seen, I think, I think if I may address, I'll address a little later on in the sermon, but I'll address it right now. Some, I'd, I'd say, concerns of a preoccupation with earthly things that we would be tempted towards. I have seen a preoccupation with dislike and disgust with our government's actions that I think has the potential of clouding out some of our affection for the Lord Jesus. I've seen it in the church, and it's, it, it, should, it should concern us. Now, as we evaluate our present situation that we're living under, I think we're right to say this is wrong, this is wrong, this, is, this would be right, they're not doing this. But there is among, among us, we're being drawn to a place where it could very easily become more about opposing what is wrong as opposed to having a hot heart for Jesus Christ. And the dislike of what is wrong should be stemming from a hot heart towards Jesus Christ, lest we lose our first love. I think go both directions. You can go in that direction. Or you can go in another direction, where I think some... Very tempted to live for the sake of the world. We want to make the world happy. We want to make the people at at the job happy. We want to make our friends happy. And we're being tossed to and fro because of what people think. And we're constantly, and you can do this in the church too, being tossed. I wonder what the people at church think. Like, don't worry about it. Keep your eyes on the Lord Jesus. Because the minute you get your eyes off the Lord Jesus is the minute you're becoming preoccupied with earthly things. And you're going to lose what the Lord wants to teach you. Okay, And we don't want to miss out on that. These guys were missing out on it because they were preoccupied with their appetites. And you can have an appetite for all kinds of things. The attention of people, the approval of people, keeping up with the times, or opposing the times. Either ditch can be dangerous. I've seen so people so focused on what their friends think, or what... They perceive other Christians think that they lose their focus on Christ. And I've seen people so focused on opposing the times and the ridiculousness of the times that they can easily lose focus of Jesus, the Lord. Either way, what's our focus? And it should be our Lord Jesus. They forget that the Lord provides. They forget that the Lord provides. Verse 9, Jesus reminds them, Do you not yet perceive? Do you not remember the five loaves for the 5,000 and how many baskets were gathered? He asked them that question. He's referring to the feeding of the 5,000 in chapter 14. Right? There were five loaves, 5,000 people. 
Jesus multiplied the loaves, and at the end of the day, there were 12 basket full, baskets full left over. All right, then in verse 10. Are the seven loaves for the 4,000, and how many baskets were gathered? Okay. And there, there's some loaves here, seven loaves. 4,000 people are fed with seven loaves, and how many loaves are left over? Well, seven baskets full of loaves at the end. So the loaves are multiplied. The first multiplication of the loaves is for the Gentiles. The second multiplication is for the Jews. There's something symbolic going on there. Twelve baskets go out from the Jews, and then the Gentiles are fed. But then verse 11, he says to them, How is it that you fail to understand that I did not speak about bread? Beware of the leaven of the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Christ is very patient in his correction of the disciples. He doesn't chastise them, but he does correct them. But I want you to notice how he corrects them. Because this is, this is instructive for us. Notice how he corrects them, corrects them. First of all, he doesn't tell the disciples the right interpretation of what he just said. He simply tells them they got the wrong interpretation. So, verse 11. How is it that you fall, fail to understand that I did not speak about bread? Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He doesn't tell them what the right interpretation is. He tells them that they got the wrong interpretation. He's asking them to remove themselves from the hunger pains in their bellies and their preoccupation with food, and be a little more reflective about his teachings. And his teaching isn't about not buying pharisaical bread. His teaching is about the leaven that can work into their lives, which is pharisaical and religion. But he doesn't tell them that. He just tells them that they got it wrong, and then essentially asks them to reflect a little more on what's right. So, and this is instructive for us. I think one of the things that we need to do is opposed to always looking for the right answer. I mean, so many, so many have, and the study Bibles are very helpful. I have a few of them. I have a number of them on my shelf, and I do consult them. But there's an advice that an older pastor gave me when I was a younger pastor, and that is draw your conclusions for your sermon prep by your own study and then consult other people's studies after that. Let the Holy Spirit percolate in your heart as you search the scriptures and seek to understand the scriptures and then use the other works of other people to make sure you haven't gone off the path, right? But I think so many of us, if we want to learn what the Bible says, well, what's the notes say? What's, what's, what's the commentary say? What's, what's someone else say? Is opposed to allowing the Holy Spirit time to kind of work in your heart as you reflect upon it and you compare it to what other part, aspects of the scriptures have to say. And the Lord Jesus is simply asking the disciples here to be a little bit more reflective with what they hear. And that's something we need to learn. Because we want fast answers now. But it's a gift of the Lord to be able to take some time and to ponder and consider and allow the truth to percolate in our hearts so that he himself can make application for us. Christ doesn't spoon feed them. He's asking them to be reflective. And they understand. They get it. The penny drops and the light bulb goes on. Verse 12. Then they understood that he did not tell them to beware of the leaven of bread. They thought he was talking about bread. They understood that's not what he's talking about. But of the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He, they thought he was talking about bread, but then they all of a sudden realized, no, he's talking about the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Popular religion of the day if they had allowed it into their minds and hearts, would corrupt them. It would corrupt them. False teaching. It can look good, but it corrupts you like a little piece of leaven. And here's the thing with leaven. Is you don't know it goes into the system when it goes into the system. You only know it after it's leavened the loaf. So when the leaven's being worked into the loaf you don't really notice any different. A loaf with leaven 
and a loaf without leaven look exactly the same. But then you give them time, and then the loaf with the leaven, the leaven takes effect and it rises. So you can tell the difference over time, but you do not tell the difference at the beginning. False teaching is very deceptive. And once it seeps into your heart, or once it seeps into the church, it's not, you don't know it's there until it's too late. You don't know it's taken effect, or it's, it's in the system until it's absolutely too late. It's like poison. You don't say, oh, I'm going to drink poison today. Right? Never forget the time there was a bowl of, um, on our countertop, there was a bowl of shredded soap. Joanna was making her own soap, and it looked like shredded mozzarella cheese. And I, st- I thought, oh, I'm hungry. Just stick my hand in. Oh, right? How'd that work for me? It's deceptive. I didn't know it was soap until it was in my mouth. Right? Until it started to take effect in my mouth. And you don't know the leavens in the loaf until it's too late. False teaching is carnal. False teaching is money-driven. False teaching is popularity-driven. False teaching is acceptance-driven. And that's exactly what the Sadducees and the Pharisees were driven by. They were driven by external approval and external relevance. They wanted people to like them. They wanted to line their pockets. And when people liked them and they lined their pockets, they figured they were doing a good job. Don't base your Christianity primarily on what the rest of the of the religious world or the rest of the church thinks about you. If you're thinking too much about what others think about you, there's a lack of focus there. Your Christianity is about the Lord and treasuring him as much as possible. And you keep your eyes on him. He'll lead you in the right direction. John Gill said about this passage, about the danger of leavening the loaf. Now, because they sought... Speaking of the false teachers, they sought secretly and artfully to infuse their notions into the minds of men, and which, when imbibed, spread their infections and made men, this is what happens to bread, to loaves, that's leaven, sour, okay, sourdough, morose, rigid, and ill-natured and swelled and puffed them up with pride and vanity, Christ compares them to leaven. Look, you can avoid this stuff if you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. But if you're living for the approval of men, this is the path that you end up going on. If you're living for the stroking of the ego, this is the path you end up going down. But if you're living for the glory of the Lord and the fear of the Lord, that will protect you. These guys were living for their bellies at that particular point in time. So they missed what Jesus taught them. Instead of looking for nuggets of gold that rolled off the tongue of their Savior. False teaching, pharisaical religion, does not look dangerous. It looks innocent. It does not look unchristian. It looks Christian. Okay, it doesn't look like a predator. It looks like a lamb. You ever heard of the Pharisees were wolves in sheep's clothing? The hypocrites and pretenders look just like disciples until it's too late. The Pharisees would have been the more conservative. The Sadducees would have been the more pragmatic politicians. They appealed to the political class. The Pharisees appealed to the average person. But both of them, they were polar opposites in their outlook and who they were trying to please. But both of them are united by one definite article because they're the same religion. And what is that religion? It's a Christless Christianity. It's a Christless religion. And how do you fight that? How do you fight that? Well, Jesus tells us, verse 6, watch and beware. Verse 11, beware. Watch and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. 
Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The only way to combat this is perpetual vigilance. And if you don't have perpetual vigilance, this will infect and poison your heart. Perpetual perpetual vigilance. So easily your Christianity can become about something else. So easily. You know what? I think think there's all kinds of room to be distracted right now. But let me ask you, is your Christianity about Christ? Or is it about some type of anti-government sentiment that's surfacing in your heart right now? Now, I think if your focus is on Christ, there's going to be a distrust and a disagreement with a lot that's going on. But what is your focus? Is it Christ? Or or how about this? I I think some some would lean in that direction. I think some would lean in another direction. About making your friends happy or incessantly evaluating tonality as if we need to somehow sell our message to the world with smooth talk and charm. You know, charm is looked down upon and spoken ill of in the Bible. We come to proclaim the oracles of God and then let the Lord do the work. But one way or another, you can go one direction, you can go another direction, and it's all the same religion. Because it's the pursuit of something other than Christ. My question to you today is, who and what are you pursuing? Which direction do you sense your heart being pulled in? It could be one of those two I just mentioned, or there's an infinite number of other options or combinations. But either way, the solution to it is vigilance, And being aware and being watchful and going after the leaven the minute it starts to enter your heart. And the only substitute for counterfeit religion is a true, vibrant walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you're not vigilant, you're going to drift one way or you're going to drift the other. Do you know Jesus? Because if you don't know Jesus, you're going to be sucked into something. So I want to invite you to a life-giving relationship with Jesus Christ today. He died for sinners. If you put your faith in him, he'll forgive all of your sin. Come to Jesus. And those of you who've trusted him and do trust in him, don't lose your first love. Stay close to him. And may your hearts be warm and pliable in his hands.